You get to sit your wife for me. I like that one. The grace of our Lord Jesus be with you all. That was quite good. In a lot of churches, they say, oh, then I was kind of what to say at that point. It's reasonably early and you did very well. But I think you can do it even with more enthusiasm than that. So let's try it one more time. The grace of our Lord Jesus be with you all. Now I really feel welcome to St. Seth and the Lutheran Church. Thank you very much. Would you turn to the person next to you? That's why I wanted to pass it down here too. But would you turn to the person next to you and say, I'm really glad you're here today. Now, would you please tell them something that you really like about St. Stephanie's Lutheran Church? They might have to do with Sunday school, they might have to do with music in the church, they might have to do with a Bible class you go to, your wonderful traditional building here, it's absolutely beautiful. Um, I don't know, the bathroom, something you like about St. Stephanie's that you say to the person next to you. Um, 
uh, I cried, I am ruined, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips, and my eyes have seen the King, the Lord Almighty. One of the seraphim flew to me with a live coal in his hand, which he had taken with tongues from the altar. With it he touched my mouth and said, This has touched your lips, your guilt is taken away, and your sin atoned for. And I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send, and who will go for us? And I said, Here am I, send me. And even if you cannot see it, God is on his throne. His train fills the temple. The seraphim are singing back and forth to each other, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. The foundations of St. Stephanus shake a little bit, even if you don't feel it. Even if you don't hear it, even if you don't see it, he's here in the midst of his people. If he's here, he's accompanied with his here. And he is honored and hallowed and glorified in our midst. How do you feel now? Woe is me, Isaiah says. <laughs> what in the world am I doing here? I am unclean. I am unworthy. And you came in that way. I don't know if you thought of yourself that way, really, but you were, you admitted it. And you acknowledge your sin, and Pastor Rich got to do the best thing a pastor ever gets to do. He gets to do it in Holy Baptism, he gets to do it in Holy Communion, and he gets to do it in the Holy Absolution. He got to say to you, your sins are forgiven. Not with a tongue and a hot burning coal with the precious blood of your Lord and Savior who died on the cross 2,000 years ago, half a world away, virtually ignored by the population, but dying for you. If the pastor can say to you, believe it or not, if you truly repent of your sins, you are forgiven as if they had never occurred and never happened. Who here has a big brother? Okay. I'm not going to win now. We, we've never met that. We've never prepared this. <laughs> How are you? <laughs> you got a big brother. If your big brother is really tough and strong, is that enough to know? Or is that kind of nerve wracking? Kind of, he said kind of nerve wracking. It's the right answer. <laughs> we haven't ever said that. He said kind of nerve wracking. If your brother really loves you, but he's a little squeaky guy, and there are bullies all around. Is that very encouraging? Not really. If your brother loves you, but he's not strong, if he's strong and he doesn't love you, either way, it doesn't work very well. We worship a God who is strong and who loves us. And no one of faith believes that. We talk about many roads to heaven and all this garbage that you sometimes hear, and we want to believe that because it's a tolerant thing to do. But no other faith holds up before you. God loves you. And our gospel today ended with those words, God so, you can say it if you want to, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, and whoever believes in him would not perish, but have everlasting life. And of course that comes from, and you can look it up if you don't know it, but I know you know it. 1 John 3.16 says something a little different. It says, this is how we know what love is. Jesus Christ laid down his life for us. And if he laid down his life for us, we should lay down our lives for one another. But he who has his world's goods and sees his neighbor in need and has no pity on him, how does God's love abide in him? Little children, let us not love in word and speech, but in deed and in truth. This God who loves us has blessed us like no other people in the history of the world. He showered his blessings upon us, even more than on our parents or our grandparents. And we live in a free society that the world has never known. Why are we so blessed when half of the world is hungry? Why are we so blessed when others live in misery? Even the poor in this world, and it's tough being poor in this world, in this country, but even the poor in this country don't have it like the poor in other parts of the world. 
without food stamps, mothers wind up feeding their children dirt cookies in the islands and in Central America. There's a sample of it down the table down the bottom. In the absence of community shelters, people live under tarps or pieces of plywood or cardboard boxes. In the absence of wealth, people go to the dump and dig out those that are left over, trying to make some kind of scratched out living for themselves. Why are we so blessed? Is it not that we might be the means by which God in his grace, having blessed us, would be a blessing to others? The result of Isaiah hearing this incredible meeting with God was, here am I, send me. Has God not blessed us to be a blessing? I believe he has. I represent a ministry called Food for the Poor. Uh, some of you, I think, support that ministry already. Would you raise your hand if you already support the I want to thank you very, very much for your help and your support in that work. Um, Food for the Poor, for those of you who are not familiar with it, is an interdenominational ministry of Roman Catholics and Episcopalians, ELCA and Missouri Synod Lutherans, some Methodists, and we're working on the Presbyterians. When did you ever hear of a group like that working together? We've been doing it for 30 years. Together, we feed over hundreds of thousands of people every day. Together, we have built over 70,000 homes for people. And together, we have raised over $7 billion in aid and support for missionaries and ministries of all Christian denominations working in the Caribbean and Latin American 17 countries here. Because we're not under any one denomination, we're monitored by four independent financial watchdog agencies, each of whom has given us their highest rating. That includes a better business bureau. But I'm most pleased and anxious to tell you, as in all the years I've been associated with them, over 96% of everything given to food for the poor actually gets to the poor. That's something you need to ask any charity that was knocking on your door. How much of what I give will actually go to the people I'm trying to help? And if it's 80% or so, it's considered a pretty good average to do that. All the years I've known them, it's been over 96% every year, year after year. Would you take out the folder that came in your, I think the news part of your bulletin? It's like this. And if you open up all the way, you see a pink strip, and next to the pink strip, a perforation. Would you tear down that perforation? So now in your left hand, there's a folder with pictures. You get bored listening to me, you always look at the pictures there. In your right hand, is something that looks alarmingly like an envelope. Because it is. And on the envelope, there's a little flap. What does it say on the flap on the envelope? Good and loud. Prayer request. Food for the poor, first and foremost, sees itself as a ministry of prayer. Every morning before work begins, every afternoon after work ends, the staff of Food for the Poor prays for the uh, names that come back from the pastors that previous Sunday. Um, I'm asking you, would you please write down on the sheet right now? the name of someone you're praying for that you'd like us to pray for with you in this coming week. It might be someone in your family, immediate or extended. It might be someone at your work or someone that you live near. It might be somebody here at church. But everyone in this room, everyone here this morning, should write down on here the name of your pastor and your pastor's family. Congregations need to be praying for their pastors. Several years ago, President Jerry Keishner of the Lutheran Church, Missouri Senate sent a letter out to pastors and congregation that included this particular paragraph that I refuse to forget. In that paragraph, he said, how difficult it is to be a pastor these days. It's a difficult time. The world has grown more cynical and more secular. And it's not easy being a pastor, as, as in many cases, churches are suffering decline. And congregations, as their first ministry, should be praying for the pastors and their pastors. What a great way to undermine a church by getting at the heart of discouraging a pastor. So would you please put down your pastor's name and anyone else that you'd like us to be praying for with you. If you don't do anything else with me today, so you put that slip in the envelope and if you give us the envelope at the end, maybe that offering plate that we talked about in the back. Um, if you give it back at the end of the day, I'll see if it gets to, to Florida. But I'll look very bad in your eyes if I don't bring back a lot of prayer. So would you please be sure you, you put down some names there. Normally now, I would go 
go over to the fold, I tell you an amazing thing. Normally I would go over and I'd share with you that $21 will feed 350 children on the hill. $21 will feed 350 children on the hill. I think that's an amazing thing. And I talked to you about how when, when my wife Dottie and I go out to a restaurant, I, I can't sit down and think of feeding my well-fed face and not think of the 350 children who are not there with us. So each time we go out, we take 350 children to dinner with us. We had $21 in the bill, save it up until he has $105 and send a check off to food for the poor. And normally I would ask you, would you please consider now for the next three months, once a month, taking 350 children out to lunch for $63. That's what I would normally say to you. But these are our normal times. On January 12, 2010, 4.51 p.m., Great seventh earthquake devastated Port Prince Haiti. Within 35 seconds, 250,000 people are estimated to have died. An equal number to be injured. The palace, which you may have seen pictures of by this time, was barely damaged. And much more damage beside that. But BP oil company spilled a lot of oil in the Gulf of Mexico. And Chile had a bigger earthquake, less damage with a bigger earthquake. And New Zealand had two. And Japan had an earthquake and a tsunami. And all across our southern states, there have been tornadoes. Joplin, Missouri, and Charlotte, North Carolina, and Alabama, and all different places, tornadoes the last year. So that frankly, over these last two and a half years, we kind of forgot about what happened in Haiti. But if you take all of those events together and combine them, the death toll does not equal one-tenth of the death toll of Port of Prince that January afternoon. And every one of those societies has much more resources to help them rebuild and get back on their feet than Haiti ever did. As the earthquake struck, the palace was destroyed. Behind the palace was the Hospital. The hospital surgery was completely destroyed. Many people, and you'll see some soccer players on crutches who have amputations from the destruction there. The amputations had to be done with materials purchased at a hardware store, with flashlights and a lack of anesthesia. Behind that was the nurses' quarters, and the total second year nurses' class was destroyed, killed along with their instructors. At the seminary, all the seminarians were killed. At colleges, the brightest and the best of the kids were killed in those earthquakes. I'm told that more people died in the United Nations peacekeepers force that afternoon than any other single event in United Nations history. 200 people died in the United Nations headquarters, and another 100 died in a hotel at a meeting. It gets personal. At 4.30 p.m., a young girl was from Lynn University. Lynn University would send students, along with members of Food for the Poor, down to do work in the islands. This young lady called home to New England, spoke to her parents, and said, Mom and Dad, I know what I want to do with the rest of my life. I want to spend the rest of my life helping the poor down here in the Caribbean. The rest of her life lasted 21 minutes, and she was one of the four students, two faculty. Leanne Chong, the leader of that group, stepped, went to step out of her room and as she was going between the bed and the dresser, the floor gave way beneath her. She fell two stories, three stories fell on top of her. She was trapped in a fetal position, able to move only her fingers and toes for 17 hours. Finally, her feeble cries for help were heard. And she was rescued. And you know what she's doing now? She's back in Haiti, leading groups of people to see the damage and to try to help. 